Hello, hello. How's the audio? Good, good. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Michael Strike. Uh, I am the speaker and the chief technical evangelist over at the QRL. So, my uh, just just a moment about me. My classical background is route switch firewall process improvement. I've been a network engineer for a long time. My non-classical career is here at the quantum resistant ledger. I've uh, been in blockchain since about 2013. And uh, I, most of the slides have a lot of the words on it, so that I know that half of you probably aren't even listening, so you'll be able to circle back to it if you, if you hear anything interesting, and I've already moved on. All right, let's get started. We're going to try and do something fun here. We're going to try and make blockchain and quantum fun and sexy. One of those might work, probably not both at the same time, but let's see. All right, who are we? <clears throat> Our project is the Quantum Resistant Ledger. We've been running our own layer one since, uh, actually that should say 2018. Uh, we're the only blockchain that, in the world that uses an NIST recommended DSA since the first block, which makes us fully quantum computer secure. We have coming up this year by 2025 our Zond hard fork. And with the hard fork, we're gonna be migrating to some new NIST standards, uh, which we're gonna get into a little bit shortly. So. Let's move on. Who knows what a quantum computer is? A, okay, I saw two hands. All right, let's, let's see if we can have some fun with this. So your phones, your PCs, all the computers you see in front of you, these are all classical computers. They all have what's called very deterministic outcomes. Quantum computers have probabilistic outcomes. And the the part of nature in quantum mechanics that makes it possible to be able to have a probabilistic income excuse me, uh, outcome, and be able to solve problems that classical co computers cannot is because of quantum's, quantum superposition and entanglement. If I start talking about either of those, they will pull the mic, but if someone else wants to, come down by the booth and I'm happy to do that. So essentially, quantum computers enable an exponential speed up for solving specific problems, such as the elliptical curve discrete logarithm problem, which underpins Bitcoin's ECDSA. We will get into that a little bit more. So this is an abbreviated version, but this is essentially how a Bitcoin, trend, a Bitcoin wallet is created. A Bitcoin wallet, when you create a private key, is nothing more really, really more than a 256-bit random number. Using ECDSA with the SECP 256K1 parameters, that's a type of ECDSA, you create a public key, and that's like a one-way function. Now you, have, now you have a private and a public key. This is also why you can create a Bitcoin wallet offline. So how do transaction outputs work? So this is necessary to understand in order to uh, understand the DSA, which I'll get into, and also the solution, which I'll we'll also get into. So when you're doing a transaction output on Bitcoin, the first thing is you, uh, you, you present your public key, the one that you generated from what I was talking about a moment ago. You present your public key to the node that you're sending your transaction to. Eventually, that gets hashed using SHA-256. It gets hashed a second time, and that reduces the public key size. Essentially, the final output is what's actually called a Bitcoin address, which gets written to the blockchain in most transaction types, but not all. Essentially, what this means is a Bitcoin transaction sent most of, the most of the time means the public key is exposed. And that all goes back to that's OK with asymmetric cryptography. You're supposed to be able to reveal your public keys. but that also goes back to the 1970s when asymmetric encryption was initially proposed. What's a DSA? When it comes to post-quantum security in blockchain, the DSA is everything. DSA is a cryptographic method for signing and verifying data using public key cryptography. ECDSA is uh, what the DSA that Bitcoin uses. And that is based on the ECDLP problem, which is hard for classical computers to solve, as we talked about earlier. Everyone with me so far? Yes? All right. So what's the problem? Well, Bitcoin and 99% of all other altcoins have essentially a quantum problem. And the problem is Shor's algorithm run on a sufficiently powerful quantum computer can break ECDLP and thus ECDSA, which is Bitcoin's digital signature algorithm, 
and a lot, it, it can allow a private it can allow a private key to be created from a public key, public key, which is not supposed to be able to happen. So that's Salt Bay, but it's actually, I couldn't find a good pepper picture, so I really wanted to use him, I did anyway. Public keys are already peppered all over the blockchains, mempools, uh, public keys are being harvested for future years, store now, decrypt later, all those things. Public keys are meant to be out in the open, and they are. So what's that risk? Older Bitcoin transactions, in a lot of cases, the public key is stored directly on chain. Yay, immutability, but oh, immutability also has a couple caveats in that in the early days of pay to public key hash transactions, the public key is actually written to the blockchain and there may be funds, Bitcoin funds specifically, tied to that transaction and maybe and, and that's all visible because of, you know, uh, one of the core principles of blockchain, which is immutability. So newer bit, uh, Bitcoin transactions involve presenting the public key to nodes. We talked about that a little bit early when I send a transaction or a TX output. That sh I provide my public key because that sh serves as cryptographic proof that I created that transaction and it ties to my private key. And in return, when you send a transaction out, all Bitcoin's nodes broadcast all of those nodes to all other nodes, and that way, hopefully, when a miner solves a block and sends it to a node, it will have that transaction in it. Great, okay, so this all leads us to something called Shor's algorithm. So this is a quantum computer-specific algorithm. It's quantum, it is not classical. It was developed by Peter Shor, a brilliant mathematician in 1994, designed to run only on quantum computers, although you can simulate it using a classical computer. And it has the potential to break RSA and ECC, or ECDSA, like we talked about with Bitcoin, by efficiently finding prime factors of large numbers. So, the latest estimates, and this has been on for a while now, are that a, is that a quantum computer with up to around 2,500 logical error-corrected qubits could potentially break Bitcoin's 256-bit ECDSA. We're not there yet. We don't think we are there yet. We're not there yet. Uh, a lot of people like to talk about quantum computers as far as being able to take over the hashing market and being able to up the difficulty by, finding, by solving cryptographic problems with it. it that's really, not, that's really not that feasible. The ASICs, the worldwide ASICs and the power that's being drawn right now, that would be, a, that would be attacked by uh, Grover's, which gives you a, quad, a quadratic speed up to be able to find the pre-image in order to mine faster than all of the miners. It's not really a problem. The biggest problem right now is going to be uh, Shor's algorithm. And uh, like I said, we're looking at less than 2,500 logical qubits. And that less than 2,500 really is right based on the technology as we understand it now. It doesn't accommodate for future advances in algorithms, uh, improvements to Shor's algorithm. It doesn't, maybe there's a, it doesn't, it, it doesn't apply to the type of quantum computer, being a trapped ion or photonic, whatever. So Bitcoin can just hard fork. I love this question. <laughs> So, as with many things in life, it's really the nuances that really get important. I would say Bitcoin can hard fork, but I wouldn't say Bitcoin, but Bitcoin can just hard fork. First off, you can hard fork. I give a lot of credit to uh, blockchain developers. They're some of the most creative people in the world. And I'm only saying that because there's, everyone here is a developer and I'm outnumbered as an engineer. So, but community consensus on new DSA and block numbers for uh, community consensus on a new DSA would need it, be needed. You'd have to select a block number in order to uh, start your new post-quantum digital signature algorithm. You'd have to upgrade all the nodes. You'd have to successfully hard fork. And then you'd have to deprecate all that ECDSA stuff that I talk about. That is all doable. There's nothing in the rule book. There's nothing in, there's nothing in the community or physics or anything that says that that can't be done. But I'm going to tell you guys what the catches are. And these are the things that people don't talk about. This next slide. Even if you execute it perfectly, users are going to have to make a manual transaction from the old Bitcoin address that they have to the new post-quantum secure address, be it a LAMPort signature or whatever. This is a manual thing. It can't be automated. 
It will be impossible to migrate all of the 21 million Bitcoin. The 21 million is a magic number in the ethos of blockchain. It'll only ever be 21 million. Well, there's going to be, unfortunately, it would have to be less because you won't be able to migrate all of them, and there will be orphans. That is the, that, by the way, that is Annie. She's the most famous orphan that I know, and just realized how old I was. God. So the other thing is the old DSAs must be deprecated before powerful quantum computers exist in order to protect non-migrated Bitcoin. Also, migrating old wallets to new post-quantum secure wallets will take a minimum of 74 to 300 days. I was recently had a podcast where we were talking to some academics. They were doing a paper. There was 70 to, their estimate was 70 to 80 days. And that's just Bitcoin processing power in order to take that old ECDS, ECDSA uh, Bitcoin address and migrate it. So you'll need at least 75 times, excuse me, 75 days of, some people collect to call it downtime. I don't like the word downtime, but those transactions would need to be interlaced with normal TX outputs and normal Bitcoin transactions. That's, the fit, that, that's, that's substantial. That's, that's a lot of processing time. Uh, also, we have no idea as to the real state of quantum computer progress. Uh, governments have no reason to tell us, and they stopped returning my email, so. Except NIST, those guys are great. They always, talk, they always return my emails. So here's the current ecosystem. Here's the blockchain, the blockchain challenges that we have. First off, no, ERC, no ERC-20s are post-quantum secure. You can tell me whatever you want about an ERC-20. You can... You can you can take the Library of Congress, you can XMSS wrap it, and then put it on the blockchain, but at the end of the day, if a quantum computer can empty your wallet and steal all your gas, you're not going to be able to go anywhere with it. You're done. 99% of blockchains use ECDSA and are thus vulnerable. And the other thing is you need to be post-quantum secure since the first block. Otherwise, you have this huge mess that I'm describing in, in that you have to go and have all of those previous transactions migrated to a new DSA, deprecate the old DSA, and then, and then make sure that everything's there. And then you eventually have to cut off the old DSA and stop the transactions. And whatever isn't migrated is lost. So maybe, that's, so maybe BTC becomes BTQ, or I don't know. Someone will figure that out. These are some known attack vectors. I'm not really going to go through them. How am I doing on time? Six minutes? OK. Uh, okay, these are some known attack vectors. You got a, lot of, a, lot, a couple of these have to do with the double spend. And if anyone that studied, if studied Bitcoin history, you know that that was one of the biggest problems that the Satoshi's white paper solved was the uh, double spend problem uh, based on uh, solving the uh, uh, Byzantine Empire problem. Oh, let me go back one more. Uh, if you have time, ask me in person about a novel attack vector called rogue node theory. So a lot of us, a lot of us has heard, uh, not your keys, not your crypto. We all know that, right? Not your crypto, right? We're all self-custody? No? Okay, some of us. I saw two hands. But also, not your node, not your rules. And that's not as well known. But it, it is relevant because these nuances that I'm talking about that make these attack vectors, uh, uh, that make these attack vectors realistic or work, Depend, uh, what, uh, some of them depend on that, but uh, rogue node theory depends on not your node, not your rules, always run your own node. So for, if you're looking at other blockchains that, are, that are claim post-quantum security, there's a few, I put together a few checklist items. First off, as I mentioned before, blo the blockchain should be post-quantum secure since its first block. <laughs> This second one might seem a little silly, but it's really not if, if you look at volume and uh, market caps. Does the project have an actual chain? Is the DSA in cryptography recognized by industry as experts, government, statehoods, NIST, people that know what they're talking about and the experts? Is, is the DSA recognized by them, or is it something that's closed source or proprietary or whatever? Are there any remaining legacy DSAs that are not post-quantum secure on the blockchain? If so, then I can create a transaction here that's not post-quantum secure, and I can create one that is post-quantum secure, but somehow it's the same token or the same coin, right? That doesn't maintain fungibility, and that coin should be, they should maintain value. This coin, 1.0 of this coin should maintain 1.0 of this coin. And uh, meaning, an additional post-quantum secure transaction type does not a post-quantum secure blockchain make. That is Yoda, and he is a little upset because 
he was browsing the internet the other day and he saw the, uh, a lot of post-quantum claims. <laughs> that, might not, that might not be the whole story. So we have a solution at the QRL. How much time? He's gone. We have a solution at the QRL. I'm going to move forward a little bit. We are coming up with a hard fork. It, the hard fork is called Project Zond. We're moving from proof of work to proof of stake. We're using all NIST government grade security. We're adding solidity compatibility. If you're able to code in Ethereum, you'll be able to code on our chain in po post quantum secure since the first block. You'll be able to tell your customers that you're, if, if, you, if you deploy code on us and you have your code running on Ethereum, if you smart contracts on both places, you'll be able to, in some way, tell your customers that you're post-quantum secure. This is a big deal, guys. This doesn't exist anywhere else. If you want to go post-quantum, if you want to go post-quantum secured today, besides, besides with QRL, you're going to have to make some compromises. And believe me, if you start making compromises in, in security and blockchain, the trolls are going to find you online real quick. We announced our test, we announced our beta test net live as of yesterday. This is all day zero, well, day one. Day one information. You'll be able to set up and test your own private node. I'll give anyone that wants to take a screenshot, I'll leave that on for just a sec. How am I doing on time? Two minutes. Do not take my word for it. Don't trust the guy in the hat. Governments are working on this problem as well. If you see your state there, this is, a, a, this is a short list. It's not a complete list, but it gives you an idea as to how many governments are working on this problem. Oh, and uh, United States of America, or US, just, just moved their target deadline a few months ago from 2035 to 2030 in order to upgrade all of their post quantum, all of the uh, systems to post quantum security. These are corporations, big guys. They're all working on quantum CPUs. This did not exist five, 10 years ago. Things are changing. Things are different this time. Do your own research. NFA. Questions, come see us at booth 419. I think that location's right. Uh, and those are some links. Feel free to screenshot. And uh, that's it. I'd ask any questions, but... Uh, I'm getting the eye, so I think that means I got 20 seconds left before the mic cut. Oh, okay, any questions? Did that make sense? So uh, minimum staking as it is right now is 40,000 QRL. That's last I heard. Forty thousand QRL is the coin price times the number of QRL. <laughs> Forty thousand. You'd have to. I, I I don't know what the price is right now. Sound, sounds like someone knows. All right, hey guys, thank you so much. I mean, uh, blockchain and quantum. It's difficult to talk about this stuff. You try to make it fun, but uh, <laughs> don't repeat any of this at any after bar parties. <laughs> thank you.